Anyways, man, we've got a busy couple of weeks coming up ahead of us preparing for the beast that is realignment coming up here in about two weeks. And it can be kind of daunting, especially if you don't quite understand it and all of its moving parts uh, and how the process works and, and, and the words that go along with that and everything. So on today's show, we're really going to dive into what the process of realignment looks like. Um, we'll give you some key words to look out for um, and basically kind of walk you through what all goes into realignment that happens every two years. And then in the back half of the show, we're going to be joined by Birdville ISD's associate Associate Athletic Director Miss Lisa Master to talk more about realignment and what it's like to host one of the major uh, main realignment sites in I call the, it the state War Room. of Texas. <laughs> Yeah, I've never been to Rayline. Yeah, I forgot um, this was your an, first time. Yeah, I was an intern back in 2020, so of course I didn't go. Um, and then and 2022, it got iced out. Iced out, so I'm super, super looking forward to it. It's um, a blast. And yeah, yeah, I'm really excited for all the chaos, because that's what our job is. It's chaos, but it's fun chaos. Yep. So. All right, we think it's a lot easier uh, to explain how realignment works through words um, that might be kind of confusing for people that aren't super familiar through the realignment process. So let's go ahead and start with the basics here with the UIL. You need to know, obviously, what the UIL, what the UIL stands for and their role in Leo realignment. It's the University Interscholastic League, and it's the governing body for extracurricular activities in Texas public schools. And of course, one of their main responsibilities being Texas high school football. And they are the ones that are in charge of realignment. And man, it is one heck of a job. I'm glad it only happens two year every two mm -hmm. years for their sake, because it is one beast. Well, and especially because they're not only, like, if you remember back, it used to be that they just did one districting. And right. now they split it up to where football and basketball have different alignments than the rest exactly. of the sport. So they doubled their workload, Double the work basically, which is insane. Right, right. Now, the question for that is, does basketball happen during the same time? Like, does it happen the same year as football? Football yeah, all the realignment happens at the same time. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, I didn't know if it was like one year they did this, the next year they did basketball, mm -hmm. and it kind of flip flop back and forth. Boom. That's 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 interesting. Um, but yeah, like as of right now, I think there's over 1,300 Texas high school football programs in the state. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little under that, 1,200, tw something like that. Um, but that's a that's a huge job. There's a lot of teams. And then, of course, you've got the big dogs, right? You've got the Allens and the South mm -hmm. Lake Carrolls and the Duncanville North Shore, North Shore with enrollments of thousands of students. And then you come all the way down to schools like Dell City and Benjamin um, and Klondike with enrollments of less than 100 mm -hmm. most of the times. So, I mean, I guess, for example, like me for Arlington, I graduated in a class more of more than like 800 kids you graduated in a class of like 112 112 yeah so yes we didn't even have 500 kids in our high school <laughs> right right there's i mean just so many different schools so many different sizes of schools so and they're also like hundreds and thousands of miles not thousands but hundreds of miles away from each other like if you take the el paso high school footballs right on way 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 in the west and then go all the way out east to Texarkana like that's a lot of distance mm -hmm. in between those schools so there's got to be some way that you can put it all together and figure out who's going to play who depending on where their location is and how many um, students, students are in each of those schools so again that's where the UIL comes in and they say hey here's who you're going to play based on again location and how many people you have in your school. So realignment is essentially just the restructuring or in this case, redrawing of districts. And this happens every two years. So like we said, back in 2022 was the last year that that happened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then of course this year, it's going to happen again in a couple weeks. So let's go ahead and start with snapshot day. Snapshot day is, this is the day that schools are required to turn in their enrollment numbers for that next coming season. And it always happens in October. I believe mm -hmm. this year it uh, was October 27th. October 27th. Yes. Um, but anyways, this is like the first major step of realignment um, is figuring out 
which where these schools fall into each category, which of course takes us down to the classifications. 1A through 6A here. Um, and you can see here some of the cutoff numbers for that. Uh, we'll get that to that in just a second. But 1A, of course, being the smallest classification, 6A being the largest classification. And they figure out where these schools fall based off the cutoff numbers that the UIL presents every two years for realignment. So you can see up here from 6A, we'll start in 6A. Actually, no, let's start down in 1A. So you're going to fall in the classification of 1A if you have 104, 105 students or below. And then so up to 2A from 105 to 253, you will fall in the 2A range, 3A, 254 to 544, 4A, 554 to 1314, 2A, 1,315 to 2,274. And then, of course, 6A, if you have more than 2,275 students enrolled in the school at that time, you will be placed in class 6A. Now, 6A, you only have one division, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. But until when you the playoffs. move down, until, of course, until the playoffs. When you move down to the 5A level and below, you get split up into divisions. Now, there are 32 districts in each classification. 32 in 6A, 16 in Division One, 16 in Division Two, for 5A through um, 1A. 1A. Um, and they'll be placed in either Division One or Division Two based on their enrollments like you see right there. So overall, you have your classifications, and that's just kind of like the setting point, right, for, I guess, just 6A and then the rest. And then they take it a step further, and they say, hey, because a lot of the times, I mean, when you get down to like 2A Division One, 2A Division Two, like those schools are a lot farther apart from each other. So it's like mm -hmm. you really got to be placed more specifically in a classification rather than like 6A, for example, Arlington ISD, right? There's five, six, 6A high schools in 6A. So there's really no need for like a Division One, Division Two. Like they're all right, right there. Well, well, and the other thing is too, when you start like legitimately thinking about it as well, divisional numbers mean so much in divisional splits mean so much in the smaller schools because you think about that if you're looking at 3a division one they can have up to 544 right. kids if you go down to division two the lowest number that would still be put in that division is 254 i mean you're talking about a legitimate 300 person different like difference there right and that makes such a difference from straight up just enrollment numbers in the athletic programs correct when you get up to 6a and every single school has at least 2275 students they're not playing most of them aren't playing multiple sports right you're picking exactly. something and you're sticking with it so the difference between Yes, Allen is an extreme, but if you take a normal 6A program that has like 4,000 students mm -hmm. and one that has 3,000 students, guess what? You're still going to have more than enough good talent that you don't need to split those divisions. The difference between Duncanville and DeSoto playing each other, even though Duncanville is much bigger than DeSoto, they both have athletes. DeSoto won this year, you right. know, so exactly. it's like that's why they don't split off because you're you have so, so many, much to choose right, from exactly but yet you go to the smaller classifications and the difference between a 2a division one team that has 253 and a 1a to, division two yeah I mean, exactly even at that point, like um, it's, yeah so it's just it means so much more and mm -hmm. the other thing that you'll notice here too that doesn't need to go left unsaid is that look how closely they break these teams into that mm -hmm. 5a division one 128 schools 5a division two 122 schools like 3A Division One has 101 schools. 3 Division Two has 100. So that's right. a whole extra layer on the UIL that they have to focus on is trying to keep those divisions like pretty similar with how many programs are in them. That's why they don't know until snapshot day what the cutoff numbers right. for those divisions are going to be because if there's 150 schools in 3A Division One and only 50 schools in 3A Division Two, they need to switch the numbers around. Right. Exactly. So then, so once UIL has got them, got schools split up into classifications and then divisions as well as districts, like I said, there's 32 districts in each classification, 16 in each division for 5A 
uh, down to 1A. Then they're kind of split up here into regions. And this really never changes. The regions, it's, I mean, the schools in each region change, but the, the format, I guess, for mm-hmm. the regions stays the same. And there's four in Texas, starting out in West Texas. It kind of snakes around the state of Texas clockwise. So you get four regions starting off in West all the way down to the South. And you'll notice here, so this is the 6A alignment for football Mm -hmm. from this past realignment. So this one on realignment day, when you're going to the UIL website and you're going to see what, this is what you're going to see. But you'll notice here, since there are 32 districts in 6A, then they break them down. Each region is district 1 through 8 is region 1, 9 through 16 is region 2, 17 through 24 is region 3, and district 25 through district 32 is region 4. So I just feel like there's so many people that they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah I get the district numbers and like I understand, but I don't understand how you the, remember regions. regions. Yeah, and it's right. like, if you know the district number, mm-hmm. you can eat, like you can know the district. So that's 6A, that one's a little bit different, like we mentioned, in Division 1. One because they split up the 32 districts into a division one with 16 teams and division two with 16 mm-hmm. teams. You do the follow the exact same rule, but instead of one to eight, you go one four is region one, five through eight is region two, nine through 12, region three, and 13 through 16, region four. Right. So if you know what your district number is, you can know what region you're in. Just right. divide it by four. Exactly. Yeah, that's super interesting. Now, I, that's something that I didn't know up until like. Last, when you started last working realignment, here. Yeah. right, that that's how that works. Um, and it's funny. I mean, I was talking about this before the show even started. I really had no idea how realignment worked, especially in high school, because mm-hmm. like I went to Arlington um, and I remember my junior year, I guess my junior year was probably a realignment year. Yeah. Um, and Arlington Seguin moved down to 5A Division One when they were in 6A when they were just in 6A. Um, so we didn't get to play them anymore. And I was like, I don't understand why they moved down. Like, they're in the same school district right. as us. I just didn't understand. But now, obviously, it's like, oh, well, they turned in enrollment numbers that were below the 6A cutoffs. Mm-hmm. So, and they did not, I guess, decide to opt up to play in 6A. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> but, regions, honestly, don't super matter until the playoffs. Because no, they then don't. that's that's when, when you break the uh, playoff bracket into the four regions and you've right. got to see your path. That's that's the only time we, like, really start talking about regions. But it's it's good to know. And it also helps programs that think that they have a good shot for a state championship figure out like oh crap we're going to be facing off against the second best team in Mm -hmm. the first round you know or oh we wouldn't end up seeing what we think is the next best team until the state championship because we're on opposite sides of the bracket right exactly um and so most of the time I feel like it's pretty easy to figure out where these schools are going to be placed you can kind of guess oh probably going to be 6a are going to be in you know just based on location, right? Mm-hmm. But there are some outliers sometimes. And one of the examples that I've heard used a lot is Stephenville. Mm-hmm. Stephenville is in kind of a, like weird no man's land. Like they can be placed in a school district with, or in a district with Waco schools. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they've been in a district with Fort Worth schools. Um, are they going to go out to like the big country? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of just one of those weird schools where they could fit into multiple different, categories Mm -hmm. and areas around the state I don't think there's very many of those um there was one that we talked about during the playoffs that was kind of like that um it might have been Timpson Uh, Brownwood is always the one that we keep our eyes on because Brownwood is that there when I was in high school there were two years that Brownwood was in Lano's district which is I mean two and a half two hours away right but they always they can either opt to go East or West is the thing for them. Mm-hmm. Do they want to, the if they go East, their competition is a little bit stronger. Yeah. If they go West, their travel is a lot more, but it's not as difficult as competition. It hasn't been in the years past. So do they want to go play teams from the kind of Midland, Odessa, mm-hmm. Lubbock right. area, or do they want to go East and South and play Lano and burn it? And all, now th- there are different classifications now than they were back then, but Brownwood is always one of them that, they talk with the UIL and decide, 
do we want to go east? Do we want to go west? Right, right. And then you bring up a really good point, too, because sometimes schools do have a say in where they want to be placed. Like DeSoto, DeSoto for example, they recently just turned in 5A Division One numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, but, of course, if they want to, they can opt up to continue to play in 6A and then in 6A Division Two for the playoffs. Um, you can't opt down because I don't think that would be fair, but you can certainly opt up. Um, so again, if you're in 5A Division One and want to play in 6A, you absolutely are more than welcome to do so. And I think that's cool that they give the schools a little bit more of a say in that. Yeah, and like a, a really good example of that, obviously the DeSoto one is one that we're keeping our eye on and yeah. we'll talk about next week and stuff like that. But in the past, a really good one to keep your eye on is Austin LBJ. Mm-hmm. Austin LBJ is a school down in Austin ISD that would rather opt up to play teams that are very close to them to cut down on travel and cost and time and all of that stuff rather than going and playing the teams that are the same size as them that are way farther out, that are not in the city of Austin, really. And so it's like, yeah, you don't want to go up and play a burn it when you could stay home and play that. It means you're going to be playing with other numbers, but it makes more sense for them as an entity. And I feel like it does become a real issue in those large cities like that. I mean, even in the DFW area, when you've got a couple of 3A schools, right? It's kind of like, oh, well, do they want to rather you know opt up and play in a higher classification so they can stay in around the DFW area but is it like oh we're not we don't have as many people to to, to play like that so I don't know I think it's kind of cool that they give the schools the opportunity to do that if they want to um but yeah, so that's basically how realignment works. A little short version of what happens every two years. Um, and so as it comes around the corner, we hope that we can give you a little bit more of an understanding of how that process works and all of the moving parts that go along with it and really truly understand how amazing the, the UIL actually is for doing this every two years. 